In 1 John 2, 25, it says here, And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. So the first thing to consider is that why can we know that we have eternal life? Because God has promised it to us. Um, and, you know, there are many promises in the Bible. I mean, just going through the promises in John, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, John 5, 24, uh, He that uh, heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. There's that promise there. And uh, shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And, you know, one that we all love is John 6, 47. Verily, verily. So truly, true. I mean, Jesus is already making a statement of promise and he backs that up by saying, you know, verily, verily, basically emphasizing the fact that he's telling you the truth here. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that, he, uh, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So these are all promises from God that we have everlasting life. And you know what some people will say? They'll say that, you know, the gospel uh, of faith or believing on Jesus Christ to be saved was just a teaching of Paul. And that Christians that, you know, just believe that you just have to believe and be saved are just following the teachings of Paul. But how many times does John say that, you know, he's promised us eternal life, we believe we have everlasting life. And so it, it just goes to show that, you know, this message that believing on Jesus Christ is not just the teaching of Paul, it's the teaching of the apostles. I mean, how much more inner circle do you get than the apostle John, the one that leaned on Jesus' breast at dinner, the one, the one of the three that went up with him to the Mount of Transfiguration and, and saw him transfigured? So it's not just the teachings of Paul, it's the teachings of all the apostles. They, they even supported the, t the writings of Paul. And you kind of think to yourself, well, if God has promised eternal life and that's not good enough for you, and my sermon is not going to end here, but you know, if God has promised you eternal life and that's not good enough for you, then, then it begs the question, then what can be good enough for you, right? I mean, most of you here, you know that, well, you believe, you, don't know, you believe that my name is Victor, but how many of you have seen my birth certificate? So you believe that my name is Victor and that's good enough for you, right? But, but I'm capable of lying. You know, what if my name isn't Victor? What if my name is, is, is Barry or something like that? Um, but that's good enough. You accept a promise from a man, but yet you doubt a promise from God. So my point there is, is if God's promise is not good enough for you, you know, what possibly could be good enough for you? Um, let's look at a couple of verses just in regards to this. But in Luke 16, we see there the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man goes to hell. And in verse 27, he says, Therefore he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren. So this is him crying out from hell. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now, I just forgot to mention in my last sermon, because um, I was just thinking when we were talking about the baptism for the dead and being able to get people baptized who are burning in hell. And, it, and I just wanted to, I wanted to bring you to this passage, but I forgot to, and say, you know, with the rich man burning in hell, why did he request for somebody to go preach his brethren the gospel? Why didn't he just say, send somebody to go get baptized for me? Well, he didn't, right? Because that's not what's going to get him out of hell. Well, that, well, that's not what gets you out of hell. See, what he's begging for here, he knows that he, he cannot get out of hell. And that's why what he's begging for here is for somebody else to tell his brethren that they won't come to hell where he is. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. So this is the, the promises of God, the word of God. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So what is he saying here? If they don't hear if they don't believe the word of God, they're not even going to believe somebody, even if they rose from the dead, to tell them um, about the afterlife, about heaven and hell. And I see that same principle here in this passage is if God's word is not enough for you to give you assurance, 
then I don't believe anything can give you assurance. How can man's word give you assurance if God's word uh, doesn't give you assurance? But we know that man's word does give you assurance in some things. Even though man can lie to you, you believe man. Why do you find it hard to trust and believe God uh, when he tells you something? Um, we see here, and we've gone to this passage before, but let's go to 2 Peter 1. <coughs> Verse 17, or verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. So these are stories concocted by men that are not true. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So we saw him with our own eyes, he's saying. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice, so this, this voice that they heard, this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So Peter is saying here, we were there on the Mount of Transfiguration. We saw Jesus transfigured with our own eyes. We heard the voice from heaven. But then he goes on to say, but we have also a more sure word of prophecy Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we see there that the Scripture, the Word of God, the promises of God, are more sure than even your own experience. They heard it, they saw it, but Peter is saying that the word of God is more sure. So the word of God to, to us should be more sure than our own experience. It should be more sure than even the testimony of another man. And yet we accept those things above God. Why can we not accept uh, the promises of God when he promises us eternal life? 